Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome. Um, I can see the number creeping up. Um, let us know in the chat where you are dialing in from. I'm interested to see what far flung places people are dialing in from. And let us know if you're drinking, if you've paired wine with today's session, please let us know what you've paired um, with our Taste of Summer webinar today. Welcome, welcome. And I suppose I should say good afternoon or good morning or good evening um, to all of you. Um, just so you know, this event is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it um, back if you like. It'll be on the um, events hub, the WST events hub um, on YouTube. Um, but it looks like quite a few dialing in already, so you'll be able to be watching, watching things live. Um, I'm going to just see. So we have, oh my gosh, a lot of places. Canada, India, Chicago, London, Brussels. Oh my gosh, we are truly global. Um, that's fab. And hopefully some of you, hopefully most of you have a lovely glass of something to pair alongside the webinar today. Um, and today we're going to look at a taste of summer. So perfect pairings for summer, which has yet to appear in London, but I'm told it's going to happen anytime soon, uh, once this sort of grey, rainy drizzle subsides for at least a few days, I'm hoping for a few days of summer. Um, I'll introduce myself first. Um, my name is, oh, hang on a second. There we go. Uh, my name's Anjali. Um, I'm an educator at the WSET School in London. Um, I look at our events programme as well. So uh, maybe some of you who've dialed in have been over to the school or have done some events with us or some courses. Um, these are our handles, so WSET School London um, on Instagram and, and that's my handle there, Angie Douglas Wine, very imaginative. Um, now, what we're really going to focus on today is food and wine pairing. And um, with the specific um, emphasis on summer food and wine pairs. And before we get a deep dive into some of the kind of food and wine pairing um, combinations that I've been looking at, um, I thought we'd start like right from the beginning. Um, and so firstly, the idea of food and wine pairing kind of almost full stop is something that I think is really, really fun and you can have a lot of fun with, but unfortunately there's a lot of fun police involved in the world of food and wine pairing. Um, and it's definitely a subject that a lot of um, people I think can feel like they might be doing something wrong or not making the correct pairing. Um, there are certain rules people feel they need to follow. And I'm here to tell you that Really, there shouldn't be any rules. Um, the best food and wine pairing is really whatever you want to drink with whatever you want to eat. And I mean that in kind of lots of different ways. We all have completely different palates. So everybody tastes very, very differently. And so there may be weird and wonderful food and wine pairings that you think are absolutely fantastic that you've yet to find anybody else um, on board that train with you. I know I certainly do. Um, and really it's not something to worry about. It's something to really have fun with, experiment with. Um, and I think that can be the most fun part of food and wine pairing is to really kind of see how different foods and wines interact with each other and um, give things a go. Um, something else I've put down there is pair the mood, not the food. And really that is an ethos I kind of live by when it comes to food and wine pairing. And I think no more so than when it comes to summer barbecue food and wine pairings, because we've got much more than the specific kind of structure of the wine and the specific dish to take into account. The weather, very important in what kind of wine you might want to be drinking. Um, the company, 
Um, I also think when it comes to kind of a summer barbecue, maybe that's an occasion where you want to prioritize something kind of fun, easy drinking, something that will, uh, will be kind of a crowd pleaser. And it might be that in kind of really, really warm weather with kind of plastic glasses and they're sort of flies um, hovering around your picnic, for example, you might not want to be opening your finest, finest bottles. You might want to be opening something fun and um, just delicious. So some more kind of things to keep in mind when we get um, a little bit geeky, as we will do um, for some of our food and wine pairs. Now, what I've done, as I did for, we did a, a Christmas webinar on along similar lines, and I've done the kind of same thing, which is that I have cooked myself four different um, barbecue summer recipes, and I've paired a wine with each one. So these were all experiments that, I, I did, you know, it's hard work, but somebody's got to do it. Um, I did at home and paired specific wines with some of these specific dishes. So I'm essentially going to report my findings to you, uh, let you know what I found out about these food and wine combinations. Now, if any of you have done um, courses with us, you'll be familiar with this slide already. It's really useful one to go over when you're looking at food and wine pairing. It gives you a real one stop shop into the interactions that food has with wine. Um, and this is something you look at if you take the level one with us, if you take the level two as well, we look at it. Um, and it's something to really um, have a play around with, whether you do that through our courses or kind of in your own time, it's kind of quite fun to taste some of these styles of food and see what interactions they're having with some of the wines you have in front of you. And so I'll just break it down a little bit before I show you some of the dishes and some of the wine pairings that I've made. Um, and firstly, we can see this grid is sort of slightly color coded. So if we first take into account sweet and umami food, these are written in red um, and they're kind of written in, in red because they are, I kind of call them our food hell. Um, and what I mean by that is sweet and umami food will generally, generally give you a slightly more negative interaction with your wine. Um, now, I imagine most of you have heard of sweet foods, um, all of your desserts. Uh, but it's umami food that maybe some of you aren't fully um, familiar with. Umami is one of the fifth, the fifth kind of taste um, that you can pick up on your palate. So we have five in total. We have sweet, salty, acidic, um, bitter, which we leave off. Um, there's not loads and loads and loads of bitter foods that we eat very regularly. So we, we leave that one off. Uh, and then the fifth one is umami. Now, umami is a very difficult um, taste to define. Um, it's very, very savoury and it can, I think, be translated to something along the lines of yumminess, savoury yumminess or something like that. So that might give you a little bit of a steer. Um, foods that are very high in umami include things like cooked steak, cooked mushroom, um, soy sauce, miso, um, tomatoes, very high in umami as well. So if we take our food with a lot of sweetness and or our food with high levels of umami, the effect that eating these foods will generally have on our wine is written in the next column. So the wines will taste more drying and bitter. And by this, I mean the sensation of tannins will be amplified. So that bitter mouth drying quality that tannins have will be amplified if we taste sweet or umami foods. So now this can be in reds, most commonly is in reds because it's red wine that contains our tannins, but you can also pick up tannins from storing wines in an oak barrel. So you might be picking up a little bit of that kind of drying and bitterness if you've put your white wine in an oak barrel. So it's something to be a little bit aware of when pairing sweet or umami food with a wine is that you will really dial up the volume on those tannins. Um, another uh, effect of tasting kind of sweet or umami food with your wine is you'll increase the perception of acidity. So the wine is going to taste, well, more acidic. Um, and at the same time, you're going to dial down any sensation of sweetness or fruitiness. And it's generally these things we do want to amplify in wines. And generally, when we're drinking red wines in particular, we want to smooth out tannins and make them taste really lovely and smooth. Um, 
potentially soften out some acidity as well. So it's generally our sweet and umami food, which will give us a more negative impact um, with wine. And by contrast, our food heaven, our food saviors, our salty and acidic food. Now, the reality is most dishes are a combination of several of these, if not potentially all of them, um, in order to make a kind of balanced dish. So some of you might be thinking, well, hang on, if umami is in lots of steak, then why is steak and uh, Malbec a really classic food and wine pairing combination? And the kind of the answer to that is that that steak is almost always seasoned with salt. And as we can see from our column, what salty food or acidic food will do is smooth out tannins. So decrease the perception of those tannins, make the wine seem less drying, less bitter, decrease the perception of acidity as well. So soften out the wine, soften out any rough edges of it. And at the same time, they will amplify all of those fruity flavors. And in the case of salty food, we'll give you a fuller bodied style of wine. So the wine will taste a little bit richer. Um, acidic food will amplify the fruit. So give you a much kind of fruitier style of wine. And it's generally these styles of food that are known to have really positive kind of interactions with wine. That being said, what still stands on my previous slide is the most important thing. If you really like a very, very sweet dessert with a big spicy high tannin red wine, then you go for it. Um, this is just something to kind of keep in mind in terms of how the perception of your wine might change in the glass, depending on what you're eating. We have a few other kind of styles of food at the bottom. So highly flavored food, can be overwhelmed by, uh, sorry, highly, yes, highly flavoured food um, may overwhelm your wine. So if you've got a, wine, a food, a dish that has really, really intense flavours, you might want to think uh, a bit more carefully about pairing a very, very delicate wine with it, for example. Um, not always, but it may be that you'll stop being able to taste all of those delicate aromas and flavors in that wine if you've got a really, really intensely flavored dish on your hands. Um, so it's one thing I like to really consider actually when pairing food and wine is, is rather than matching aromas and aromas or flavors and flavors, match volume with volume. So a really intense dish goes really nicely with a really intense wine. Equally, a very delicate dish might go really nice with a really delicate kind of style of wine. So they're sort of hitting you at the same level and one isn't kind of getting drowned out by the other. Um, fatty or oily food, everybody's favorite, let's be honest, um, decreases the perception of acidity in your wine. So it can be a really nice interaction if you've got really um, fatty, rich food to pair it with a wine that has a high level of acidity, um, partly to kind of cut through all of that creamy richness. And then lastly, we've got hot or chilly spicy food. Um, and this will essentially increase the alcohol burn um, in, on, your, on your palate. So if you are tasting a dish that has, has a lot of chili in it and you pair it with a wine that has a very high level of alcohol, you'll feel even more fire. So it might be worth considering pairing a wine that has a slightly lower level of alcohol if you don't want lots and lots of fire. If you're very, very happy with lots and lots of chili and spice and no food is ever hot enough for you, then it's really worth considering pairing it with a very, very high alcohol style of wine. So again, it really depends on, on what you feel like, your palate um, and what you would prefer the kind of interactions to be. So with that, um, I'll first take you into some of the regions that I've covered uh, in terms of looking into barbecue food from around the world. So this is kind of summer and it's barbecue. I've made a dish from each of these countries. And I've got to say, when it comes to barbecue food, I was really spoiled for choice. Um, I left off Korea. I really didn't want to leave off Korea. I left off uh, Japan, Brazil. There are so many countries around the world that have the most fantastic barbecue um, traditions and um, kind of specific quirks to those cuisines. And so for the next one, for the next one, we'll cover all lots and lots of additional countries. But for here, I've gone with four. I've gone for uh, an Indian barbecue recipe, um, a Greek one, 
barbecue from the USA and a Spanish barbecue recipe. And it's with each of these dishes that I have paired a specific wine. Um, and so let's kick off with India. And I decided to make, uh, I wanted to do something in a tandoor. I am not blessed enough to have a tandoor. So my uh, very affordable, um, slightly rickety barbecue had to do the job for most of these. Um, but I managed to get it very, very hot, as you can see from the image. And I uh, made some tandoori paneer. So I marinated it a little bit before and then made some skewers with some peppers and onions. I also paired it with a kachumba, which is a kind of, well, essentially a salad or kind of like a salsa. Um, you can see it in the background of my image. So um, lots of cucumbers, tomatoes, some coriander, um, lots of lime juice. So this is uh, particularly sour. Um, alongside all of those peppers and onions, we've got a dish here that does have quite a lot of acidity to it. I also made an attempt at garlic butter naan. Um, uh, to be honest, if you cover anything in garlic butter, it's very, very delicious, I found. Um, and so something else to keep in mind is that this dish also had quite a lot of spicing to it um, through each of the components. Um, so this was a, a spiced dish. It was also it had chili heat in it. So there was chili um, in the, the marinade and in the kachumba as well. Um, and there was some sourness to it as well. So these were the three key considerations I, I wanted to apply to which wine I then wanted to pair. And so, as you can see from the image, I've gone for a Riesling from Alsace. And when it comes to Riesling, our great variety from, from a region like Alsace, we generally are making these dry. So this is a dry style of Riesling. And um, that being said, I, I think actually off, an off dry style would have worked brilliantly um, too. I wanted to find a wine that had a high level of acidity. Um, I've already got quite a lot of acid going on in this dish. And if I paired this dish with a wine that had a lower level, that wine might start to taste quite flat. Um, so I wanted to make sure I had nice high acid to marry up to all of that acidity in the dish. Um, and Riesling certainly has that. I also wanted to think a little bit about the flavors. So there's lots of delicate spices in, um, in this dish. So in the kachumba, I've got lots of spices running through the marinade and the skewers. Um, and so I thought it would be nice to pair it with a wine that also has some quite delicate aromatics. And Riesling certainly does this kind of floral aroma running through it. My last consideration was because I am, I'm okay with lots and lots of chili heats, but um, I certainly didn't want to amplify lots and lots of uh, that kind of sensation on the palate. I wanted to make sure the wine wasn't really, really high in alcohol. So I ended up with Riesling and I've got to say, I think it was a really lovely pairing. It's quite classic. So some of you might have heard of it or even tasted these kind of food and wine pairings before. And I think it's a classic for good reason. Those, those delicate aromatics do really marry very well with those um, barbecue spices, especially once you put that paneer on the grill, all those spices become um, kind of toasted and more kind of amplified. So you kind of want a wine that also has some interesting aromatics alongside, or at least that was my logic to it. Um, and very delicious it was too, I've got to say. And this was an example of a barbecue that didn't get rained off. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case for all of the dishes, uh, which you will soon see. So that's our tandoori paneer. Incidentally, I'll take some questions at the end. So um, do stay tuned. We'll go through some of the other dishes and then um, we will hopefully have some time. We certainly will have some time for some questions at the end. Um, so that's my tandoori paneer with my Riesling. Um, I've gone a little bit um, off piste, shall we say, with the next um, pairing. I've gone for Red Snapper. I can only apologise for my half eaten shot. This was actually a holiday um, that I went on to Greece and uh, I was overexcited and also wanted to really make sure that I cooked it correctly. Um, so we've got a little bit missing from my Red Snapper. Um, 
and this was cooked on a grill um stuffed with some herbs that uh actually we kind of found on some of the walks uh that we'd gone on that day so um there was some kind of wild fennel um some kind of dill um wild herbs and some lemon stuffed into that um red snapper um tomato salad some grilled spring onions and some braised broad beans so really a relatively delicate dish um, we don't have anything really, really intensely flavoured. Everything's sort of balanced um, nicely together and nothing's really, really uh, kind of intensely flavoured. So I wanted to make sure not to pair a wine that would really dominate some of these more delicate flavours. Also pretty salty. So um, salted, seasoned the tomatoes very well with salt. Um, that red snapper um, had an awful lot of salty seasoning on it before it went on the grill. So something else to consider um and i've paired it with the wine actually you may not be able to see it because it may be that my my little icon is in the way but it's a wine called nautilus it's a white wine from kefalonia so rather than following to the letter the grids that i showed you initially i've also sort of taken on my own rule of um what grows together goes together um, and wanting to kind of taste a wine from very nearby um, with the kind of food that I was eating and it's a really interesting wine um, by a producer called Foivos it's called Nautilus and it, it's aged underwater so it's a it's a blend of some indigenous um, varietals uh, that the very um, geeky amongst you, uh, as I am, might want to know it, that it's a blend of uh, a grape called Vostelidi um, and Muscat. So it's got lots of lovely floral character from that Muscat. And it's wine that has been bottled and then aged underwater. So the winery has uh, special tanks uh, that they keep in, in their facility and age their wine submerged in water. Uh, and they do this for a few reasons, uh, partly to keep the wine at a very cool and constant temperature, which as some of you might know from having done some of our courses or looked into it, or if you've got kind of cellars and things yourselves, a cool constant temperature is exactly what you want for, um, keeping the condition of a wine intact. So submerging these bottles underwater meant that they're kept in a lovely, cool, constant um, condition. They're also kept in, in darkness that way, so there can, there's no light that can penetrate them. Um, and finally, submerging these bottles in water means that no oxygen can get through those bottles into them. And with a really light style of white wine, as this is, with lots of delicate floral aromatics, think of that muscat, so all of these lovely floral characters, you really want to make sure that it's kept as fresh as possible. And to do that, you want to keep oxygen away from it as much as possible. And so one quite creative way I think they've done um, for this wine is they've kept all of their uh, bottles underwater. And beyond those uh, kind of quirks and my kind of what grows together goes together mentality, another kind of few considerations for the wine was that I wanted to make sure it had lovely high level of acidity. Again, that's going to be a bit of a theme running through some of these pairings. High acidity is really, really useful when pairing food and wine together, not least when you have things like a tomato salad that already have their acidity to them. And I also wanted to make sure that the wine was equally delicate. So as I said, the dish has lots of kind of, it's, it's quite delicate in and of itself with lots of different kind of components that are all relatively delicate. And I wonder if maybe if I had paired this wine with a 100% Muscat or a really kind of intensely um, aromatic uh, grape variety, maybe the wine would have overpowered some of the dishes. I don't know, it might still have been completely delicious, but I think marrying the blends together and having a little bit of floral character coming through a little bit of fresh um, is a really lovely uh, way to kind of show off both the meal and also the wine itself. The wine can really sing with all that lovely kind of salty, quite delicately flavoured food. Um, so another success, I've got to say, another success. Um, and if we move to a kind of completely different style of food now, we're going to go to the USA. And it was one of the first 
I guess dishes or styles of food that came to mind when I started to think okay barbecue what's it going to be and it is pulled pork and as you can see this image I'm now very much indoors because in classic British barbecue style it started to rain and rain and rain as soon as I lit the barbecue um so this pulled pork started out in barbecue and then quite swiftly had to be um, taken inside and finished off in the oven. But hey, that is a very traditional barbecue of my book. Um, so there was a lot of moving parts to this. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say I had to buy a meat injector for this dish um, to inject this marinade into it. It's quite involved. So it started with a dry rub and then the marinade is quite sweet. So we've got some apple juice and some maple syrup there. I've paired it as well with um, Kansas City style barbecue sauce, which is um, also quite sweet. It's got um, well, a lot of sugar in it, actually, I can tell you, um, dark sugar as well. So it's got this kind of burnt or kind of uh, dark caramel kind of aroma to it alongside kind of onions and tomatoes and things like that. And then some slaw, uh, well, because you've got to really balance it out, give a bit of freshness. Um, and actually my sister-in-law is from the, the States and said that the slaw is often the most important recipe. That's the, the family recipe that gets um, passed down is, is everyone has their specific slaw. Um, now, this is a dish that is incredibly rich lots and lots of that kind of really rich pork it's quite a fatty cut as well um and also though yes it's a savory dish there's a lot of sweetness there so that marinade had um a few sweet components in it apple apple juice um some maple syrup and the Kansas city barbecue sauce also very sweet so as a kind of entire dish, it's quite sweet. Um, and it's got this richness, this fattiness to it as well. So again, taking some of the um, food and wine pairing kind of grid that we looked at earlier into account, this definitely is a dish that can be considered kind of fatty or oily or whatever um, we call it creamy very rich and so i definitely wanted to make sure i paired it with a wine that had a high level of acidity um, i think that was one of the most crucial things to cut through all of that richness a little bit i mean the slaw does a bit of a job of that but really the wine can also do a job of kind of cutting through all of this richness and though yes this is a meaty dish i and i did want to pair a red wine with this i'm sure there were lots of whites actually that could have been experimented with but i wanted to have a go with pairing a red and though it's a, a, a clearly a very meaty dish i did still want to make sure that the wine had low levels of tannin and that's because there is all of that sweetness here so I knew that whilst trying all of these kind of sweet, um, the, the barbecue sauce alongside the marinade may start to amplify sensations of tannin when tasting the wine and increase that perception of dryness and bitterness um, as we looked at on our grid. So I wanted to make sure the wine was high in acidity, low in tannin. And also something that wasn't on the grid was I wanted the wine to also be quite fun. I think with a dish like this, it's so intensely flavoured as well. And it's got so many kind of parts going on with it that I didn't think I, I didn't want to pair a wine that was really, really, really complex, um, really, really um I didn't want to pair a wine where the wine would be able to speak for itself. I kind of wanted to pair one that would um, go along really lovely with all of these fun, big flavours. And so I've gone with a wine that hasn't doesn't really feature huge amounts. There's not really, really wide plantings of it. It's a great variety called Trousseau. Um, it is uh, indigenous to um, France, kind of Eastern France, around the kind of Jura area. Um, there are lots of plantings of it in Portugal, actually, for the production of port. Um, and this is a wine, or oh, the grapes here are grown in California. 
So you might expect, given that we've got a really kind of warm climate here, you might expect this wine to have reached really, really high levels of, of alcohol and be really kind of rich and intense. It's actually not. It's low and it's light. Um, I think it's only 12% ABV and um, it's a wine that I chilled down. Um, knowing that the wine had had these lower levels of tannin to it and this high level of acidity um, it was a wine that I think could afford to be chilled down a little bit and what that did was it amplified all the fruity character in the wine so amplified these kind of cherry notes sour cherry red cherry quality to it and again helped increase the kind of perception of, of a freshness in the wine to cut through all of that richness in the dish so it's I guess also a fun wine because it's not really, really classic in style. Um, it's a great variety without that doesn't have wide plantings in California. It's um, more often nowadays planted for the production of, of um, fortified wines. And so they've made this wine in a slightly different way. Um, they've made it lighter and fresher with those lower levels of tannin. And so I kind of thought this is a nice wine. It's not super classic and it's a way to have a bit of fun and kind of experiment um, with some of these styles and still have a lovely fresh red wine um, alongside this dish and again I think this this pairing worked um, it was it was really lovely um, I could have done with slightly warmer weather I've got to say for my lovely chilled red I thought the sun might be shining and I might be um, eating this outside but it was not to be um, but definitely something I think not to completely discount if you're thinking about pairing uh, some wines with um, some barbecue dishes. Don't discount the reds, even if it is a really hot day. If you find a red that has lower levels of tannin that you can chill down, um, those can be really, really delicious um, summertime reds. So definitely something to, to keep in mind. And my final. Um, uh, barbecue pairing actually I also didn't cook in a barbecue I'm told you can make these uh, really beautifully in a like those wood fire pizza oven so if any of you have those and you've you've hit your quota for cooking loads and loads of pizzas over one kind of summer season then it might be really worth investigating with cooking this this is called a burnt basque cheesecake so this is my um Spanish Basque country um food and wine pairing and um, it is you can see from the top it gets kind of slightly charred over the top you put it in a very hot oven and so it still stays quite nice and kind of smooth almost a little bit gooey in the center and is more kind of firm and cheesecakey on the outside it's got this kind of lovely burnt top so it's one that you can do really I hear really brilliantly in a pizza oven um, I haven't got any other components to this dessert uh, just pure and simple a burnt basque cheesecake um an awful lot of cream cheese an awful lot of creme fraiche an awful lot of sugar uh and i've got to say it's very delicious uh and so really the key things that i wanted to kind of consider when pairing my burnt basque cheesecake with a wine was a its sweetness um a very very sweet dessert also incredibly creamy so lots of fat there we've got lots of um, cream cheese creme fraiche uh, all of the good stuff and this is going to give us a really really rich dessert now I've seen kind of lots of recipes for this cheesecake that it's often served with things like summer fruits um, or uh, well, actually, mostly I've seen kind of fruity pairings alongside this to kind of balance out all of that creaminess um, in the dessert. But I've just kept it completely classic and kept that burnt bass cheesecake completely as it is, which means the wine needs to help to balance out the pairing a little bit more than potentially it did do with some of the other pairings we've looked at, which have kind of different components and different moving parts, whereas this is one very indulgent kind of rich creamy sweet dessert and so I thought what might be fun is to pair it with a, a really really fruity wine and so then I kind of narrowed down my options a little bit 
but of course there are loads of really fantastic um, dessert wines or fully sweet wines that are completely still that would be lovely pairings with this so things like Sauterne things like ice wine things like um, Tokai would be really lovely and I just thought actually this is a really lovely opportunity to bring some Asti into the world uh, or my world of food and wine pairing um, and I think that pairing a sweet sparkling wine with the end of a meal so with a dessert is something that we should kind of all do more of because as much as I do absolutely adore loads of still dessert wines like the ones I've mentioned there is something about having already had a really large meal and then having a really indulgent dessert that can mean that that sparkle, even though it's only lightly sparkling in that um, Asti, Spumanti, is enough to kind of liven up and freshen up your palate in a way that I think sometimes really quite rich dessert wines, when the weather's really warm as well, is not exactly what you're after, especially when pairing it with such a rich dessert like this. So I knew it needed to be something sweet. Um, because any kind of dry wine would taste incredibly bitter alongside a wine like this. I also wanted to make sure it was quite light because all of this is so rich, especially if you take it into the context of having had previous uh, kind of savoury foods prior. I've got to also just caveat this by saying I didn't have all of this in one day. This was uh, spread out, um, unfortunately. Uh, and so this pairing means that we can still have something sweet and something light but we've got that sparkle that can kind of freshen up and liven up the palate after you've had maybe uh, a lot of like kind of differently flavored foods and you've really had like you've really gone to town your lunch then you've had a really lovely big dessert and then you want a wine that isn't necessarily going to also be really really full in body and have lots and lots of alcohol lots and lots of sugar um, and be that kind of really viscous style of sweet wine. So this wine does have sweetness to it, definitely, but it's also got this freshness uh, coming from the sparkle. And it's got this really sweet, uh, or well, this really fruity quality to it, which I think pairs really well when you've got a lovely dessert that doesn't have any other fruity components. It sort of brings the fruit into that combination. So another, um, maybe this is my favorite I mean I don't want to pick favorites like picking your favorite child but maybe this is my favorite pairing I thought um it's also easiest on the wallet I think um that that wine's not too expensive and you get a lot of bang for your buck uh in wines uh like Asti Spumanti you get an awful lot of kind of fruity flavor that lovely sparkling hit so um uh, a, a really lovely pairing um and so these were my four um, recipes uh, or, or four meals that I cooked and paired my, my four wines alongside. Uh, it was so much fun kind of experimenting with them. So I can't stress that enough over this summer season, uh, keep experimenting and, and maybe open up a couple of different things alongside um, some of the foods that you're eating. Um, I've got another little slide of kind of um, some top tips to kind of finish up with. So the first, acid is your friend. Um, high acidity levels in wine, whether you're pairing that with a dish that already has a lot of acidity or a dish that's actually quite creamy, the acidity in the wine is going to be uh, a lovely pairing either way. So it's hard to lose if you pair your meal with a lovely high acid wine. Um, so it's definitely something to kind of keep in mind. The second uh, that we touched on with that pulled pork pairing is to chill down those reds. Um, I think it can be something people get a little bit worried about um, uh, because you don't often see red wines being kept for too long in fridges. And admittedly, if you do chill down very strongly kind of a red wine that has high levels of tannin, that will become really, really grippy and really, really drying. But as long as you make sure that your wine has a lower level of tannin, what you'll be doing by chilling it down is dialing up that fruity quality 
giving it a bit more texture maybe and making it maybe better suited to the context of the weather and to the environment that you're in so don't be afraid to chill down some some reds i know that i chose a pretty um uh, a kind of different style uh, that might not be readily available in lots of different places, but you can definitely try the same thing with with Gamay, um, with uh, wines um, from Beaujolais, so that would be our Gamay grape or, or some kind of lighter styles of Pinot Noir as well. These lighter tannin wines um, are, are really do take well to chilling down a little bit. Well, the third is that versatility is key. Um, I think I put this on my last webinar as well. So it's it's definitely an occasion where you're likely going to have a lot of different styles of food at any one time, barbecue season. You've got people over, people are bringing different dishes potentially, you've got to cater for lots of different tastes and a lot of different kind of dietary requirements and things like that. So you're likely gonna be eating a really, really varied plate of food. And so as long as you make sure you're picking a wine that A, you really like already um, and you would be very happy with with or without food um, then you are winning uh, and it's likely going to be a wine that uh, larger kind of crowds of people might also really like so keeping to stripping things back to the basics and making sure that at least you really li like the wine and you really like um, you would really like to drink it with or without food can be a good way to go and my last tip is to just to try and have as much fun as possible with it. Um, experiment. If you've got a few people over, it's a good opportunity to have a few bottles open. And so you can kind of taste a few different things with some of the foods. Um, and that fun kind of extends to the fact that, um, as I guess it says here, it's maybe not the occasion uh, to open your finest or most treasured bottle if we've got um, plastic tumblers that have already had many, many different kind of juices and waters and liquids in them all day. Um, and you've got a really, really hot weather. It might not be the day to open up your most kind of long lived, complex, uh, treasured bottles of wine. So pick something affordable, something fun, uh, maybe something you've never tried before. Uh, and that will just help you, I think, experiment a little bit more and um, explore the weird and wonderful world of food and wine pairings kind of even more. Um, and so it's with that, oops, that I'll uh, end my presentation, but it does look like we do have a few questions. So I'm just going to bring up that box. Um, so uh, I've got a question from Laurie. Do they add the labels later? I think that's in relation to the Nautilus. Yes, they would do. Um, and that's done something done quite common with uh, a lot of wine maturation. Um, if you imagine, even if you were in like a, a cellar, say you weren't um, maturing your wine or, or, or storing it underwater, a set, cellars can be damp. Um, and it's often that you want to, uh, you, you often want that level of kind of damp, um, a, a good level of humidity in your cellar, but it does mean that you can get kind of mold growing and things like that. So just keeping them purely in glass bottles, whether you're underwater or not, is generally what's done. And then you'll label them right before you put them out to sale. Um, the tandoori as a red alternative. Oh, so this is a question from Milos. Um, tandoori is a red alternative. Would you go for would you go with something high acidity, slightly simpler red, or would you go with high tannins to give it a kick? Now, because I'm a wimp, I would probably go with something, a, a, a light red wine. So I think a Pinot Noir would work really beautifully. Um, uh, or, or actually a Beaujolais as well. So these are kind of lighter styles of red. Potentially something like a, a Cabernet Franc from the Loire uh, might be nice because these are relatively light in style, but also have this quite kind of interesting green quality to them, which might go well with some of the kind of peppers in that dish too. Um, you could certainly go with something with really high tannins and for that matter, really high alcohol too. Um, but you might be amplifying some of your, some of your chili heat there. Um, Nautilus screw cap um, or kept in bulk to mature. So they're kept in the bottles, um, as I understand it, to mature underwater. So in kind of cases of glass bottles of wine submerged underwater. Um, 
share how much the wine bottle was of the Foivos Nautilus. Do you know, I actually can't remember off the top of my head. It was definitely affordable, but I was buying it whilst I was on holiday. Um, you should be able to find it pretty easily online. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they export quite widely. So it's definitely worth checking out. Um, pairings with hot dogs or bratwurst. Um, all about the toppings and Riesling and Rosé have worked well for me. So that's a, that's a comment from Greg. And I've got to say, I completely agree. Toppings, it's something that I actually also touched upon it in, in the Christmas um, foods webinar that I think people often really, really focus on the main event. So if you imagine a Christmas table, often the main event is oh, roast turkey or something like that. But it's actually the sides that will have more of an effect if you've got loads of cranberry sauce, for example, or all those roast potatoes. What have they been kind of cooked with? Things like that. I, I think you're exactly right with the, the hot dogs. It's those toppings. What are you putting on top? Um, that compare really well. And your suggestion of rosé in particular, I think rosé is a really versatile um, pairing. Uh, so if you're ever kind of struggling a little bit, rosé in all its guises, those deeper coloured ones and those paler, lighter styles, um, or those kind of ones with a bit more grip on them, uh, are, are, can be really versatile pairings. So yes, I completely agree. If you were to choose one, so this is from Beth, if you were to choose one white and one red for a family barbecue, what would you choose? Oh my gosh, this is so difficult. So in terms of a white, well, actually, no, I think maybe red. Trying a medium kind of style of red, and by that I mean kind of medium body, medium levels of tannin, those can be real crowd pleasers. So if that really, really light kind of chilled style, it might not be, uh, if you want something that is definitely going to kind of just please everyone, then something like maybe a Reserva Rioja um, it could be really lovely, or, or a Pinotage. Pinotages often have this kind of smoky quality to them, which I think marry really well with, with barbecue barbecue now a white oh gosh a white is quite difficult I would go with probably a lightly oaked um chardonnay uh I know oak is not for everyone which is why I would want it to be heavily oaked but again it can contribute this kind of weight to the wine uh and maybe even a, another little kind of smoky character so you could pair essentially these two slightly smoky wines with all of your your delicious barbecue food um, and equally both of those styles of wine I think work really they're very very versatile they'd be fine without lots of food and they'd be fine kind of long after once you're clearing up to have that some some final glasses um, at the end of the evening too um, uh, did I try more than one wine with each meal or just the one bottle? So I pr prepped these kind of in advance. So what I did was I, I decided on my barbecue kind of dishes. I wanted to make sure I was sort of as broad as possible. And then I, I picked a wine and kind of risked it. That said, I would love to be able to kind of have multiple bottles on hand and get even geeky with this and taste some of those foods alongside different wines to see how they all kind of interacted and changed. Um, maybe one day when I can kind of keep multiple bottles open and not worry about wasting them, um, I'll get there. Uh, but yes, it's also something that you, you explore if you take um, some of our courses in our classroom courses. You often, you're in the food and wine kind of section, you often will have a flight of wines and be able to taste them all alongside different foods. So you can get really kind of into it then too. Um, we often barbecue mushrooms with balsamic vinegar. So this is a question from Manalis. Um, with balsamic vinegar, what is your opinion for pairing? Now that's a really interesting question because mushrooms are, are very high in umami and balsamic vinegar um, can be quite sweet. So this is, can be, has the potential to be quite a tricky pairing because we've got both umami here and some sweetness. So if you are pairing a red, I think a really light style of red, but actually, I think this might be where um, rosé comes into the mix. So uh, a lovely rosé from, from the south of France somewhere might be really um, beautiful with that. Um, another kind of option I will always bring out of the bag for very, very tricky pairings is if all else pale, uh, fails, pair um, 
some kind of traditional method sparkling wine. So be that champagne or carve or English sparkling wine, something like that. It has not failed me yet. Um, so I'll leave you with that to go, go out and buy a lovely bottle of champagne because uh, it's nice to have an emergency bottle on hand if you're ever wondering about what exactly to pair your food and wine with. That is uh, a bit of a fail safe too. Um, I think those are all my questions. Uh, so it just leaves me to say really, oh, I've got a, a comment, I think, from David. Um, ah, so the bottles are sealed with beeswax for that Nautilus wine and then submerged. Um, so not uh, just, their, just their screw cap. Um, a question from Cynthia, will this be available after? Yes, so this will then sit uh, in the events hub on the WSET YouTube channel. So you can um, check back over some of these uh, foods and wines at your leisure. Um, it should be up in the next day or two. Uh, and so I think that is the end of the questions. Thank you all so much for, for coming along. Um, oh, sorry, Milos, I've got one more. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna answer this one more. Um, What's your emergency? This will work with everything bottle from Milos. Okay, so yes, I've got to say traditional method sparkling wine or even something like a tank method sparkling wine, something like Prosecco um, is a really good fail safe, I think. If you're not so big on bubbles, um, then I do think rosé can really work um, for those emergency, food and wine pairing emergencies, then uh, it's worth kind of exploring some of those. Um, Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for um, coming along. Uh, watching the, the webinar and thank you for joining in. Lots of questions um, and I can thank you for them. Uh, and with that, I'll leave you. Thank you very much. Very much.